I've been following both of your work for a long time and it seems like this is kind of an, an explosive moment to be either one of you, uh, but now both of you are here together. So that's kind of yeah. a lot of excitement. I'd love to hear like what this year has been like for you guys. Mm -hmm. We can start with you, Nita. It's been a whirlwind of a year. It's been an exciting year. It's been um, a uh, bit of a terrifying year in many ways, mm -hmm. right? So I think the rapid pace of technological changes in society and the urgent need for ethical and legal uh, guidance and embedding into the rapid pace of technological advancement and AI and neurotechnology has made it exciting and terrifying because I'm not sure we will get to a place where we can align the technology in ways that really uh, maximize the benefit for humanity. And so it's been a year of me being on the road nonstop, missing my kids, but mm. feeling like there is really important work to do. And on the exciting side, it's been exciting because there is so much that's happening on the technological space that finally I think the world has woken up to the need to have really serious conversations and um, develop concrete approaches to be able to redirect technology in ways that enhance our cognitive liberty. Mm. So Aza, I mean, you've been watching this for a long time and the impact of social media, I think has been, I'm sort of really glad we had to go through that yeah. before we got hit with the AI. Um, but I'm just curious from your point of view, I mean, you've struggled to get the world to understand you know, what the implications of this technology are. I think that's become clear now. Mm -hmm. Is this a rinse and repeat with AI or are you seeing this as a completely new effort? And what, what have we learned that we can build on? I think we can frame uh, social media as first contact with AI. And like, where is AI in social media? Well, it's a curation AI. It's choosing which posts, which videos, which audio hits the retinas and eardrums of humanity. And notice, like, this very unsophisticated kind of AI misaligned with like what was best for humanity, just like maximizing for engagement, was enough to create this whole slew of like terrible outcomes, a world none of us really wants to live in. Like we see the dysfunction of the US government. At the same time that we have runaway technology, we have a walk away governance system. Um, we have like, you know, drives up polarization and mental health crises. We don't know really what's true or not. We're all in our own little like subgroups. We don't, we've had the death of um, like a consensus reality. And that was with curation AI, first generation, first contact AI. We're now moving into what we call second contact with AI. This is creation AI, generative AI. And then the question to ask yourself is, have we fixed the misalignment with the first one? Mm. No. So we should expect to see all of those problems just magnified by the power of the new technology, which is, you know, 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times more. You know, you asked, like, what was this year like? Imagine there was a fictional movie of some nation creating artificial intelligence. And at some point, it'll become powerful enough that the government will be like, all right, every single one of you tech titans that's working on this technology, get here into you know like the senate into the congress like sit down and we're going to figure out what to do right like you'd well, expect we had that meeting we had that meeting that's the point it's okay. like i feel like i am living in yeah. that movie because senator chuck schumer in a bipartisan way invited everyone to not everyone okay not everyone invited... i mean it was like it, did you notice that there was virtually zero academic voices there or people there were just a couple on, right there were just a couple which is why we're having a second <laughs> meeting in december and there will be an academic them. round table yeah. and there will be a lot more people who uh will round out that perspective so yes they all came yeah. to what i meant DC, by everyone in this case yes. was like okay. all of the tech titans yes like fair, fair sundar satya yeah. zuck Sam Altman, Jack Clark, like, and then us, like, sitting across the table and trying to grapple with this moment. I think this is the year that have really felt like that confusion between is it to utopia or dystopia that we go. Mm. Um, and the lesson we can learn from social media is that we can predict the future if you understand the incentives, right? As Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's business partner, said, if you show me the incentives, I'll show you the outcome. Mm -hmm. The way we say it is if you name the market race people are in, we can name the result. The race 
is the result. And Congress is still sort of blind to that. And so we're stuck in this question of, do we get the promise? Do we get the peril? How can we just get the promise without the peril, without an acknowledgement of like, well, what's the incentive? And the incentive is grow as fast as possible to increase your capabilities, to increase your power, so you can make more money and get more compute and hire all the best people, wash, rinse, um, repeat, without an understanding of what are the externalities. And humanity, no doubt, has created incredible technology, but we have yet to figure out a process by which we invent technology that then doesn't have a worse externality, which we have to invent something new for. And we're reaching the place where the externality that we create will break the, the fragile civilization we live in if we don't get there beforehand. Mm. Andreessen Horowitz just published something on their blog this morning or yesterday. I just received it this morning. It was sort of the return to the techno-optimism of the early 90s, yeah. which was really an interesting moment to choose that. And unfortunately, because I was coming here, I didn't get all the way through it. But I think we are really at this very bifurcating moment uh, in society. And I was asking a leading venture capitalist last night, what's the role of regulation you know, going yeah. forward? And you know, expecting, because this man is a known humanitarian, to have a much more balanced kind of view of this. And if you look at the evolution of technology, um, I mean, when we started Wired Magazine, we said, whatever's good for the internet is good for humanity. Mm. Yeah. And we really believed it, and I still believe it, as having been true back then. What happens is, over time, things evolve, and at a certain point, there has to be some kind of an intervention to course correct. That's right. So I know you've been spending a lot of time talking to all the various government agencies who are calling you in and saying, What's up? What yeah. are we doing? Is there any sense in your mind that we're reaching some kind of a white paper? Do we have a short list of things that we can all agree on? Maybe. Uh, so, you know, what's interesting and one of the things that I've been doing a lot, whether it's meeting with U.S. government agencies or international organizations, is trying to help people see these problems are all interrelated, right? That we don't need separate regulation for neurotechnology and separate regulation for generative AI and separate regulation for social media, that there are a common set of issues and that by mm. trying to address them in a common way, we can reach a lot more agreement. And so in my book, The Battle for Your Brain, what I lay out is the concept of cognitive liberty, the right to self-determination over our brains and mental experiences, and talk about how neurotechnology gives us the finest point way to understand that, right? Which is that there is the space that we had all assumed that we actually had both the capacity to govern ourselves, uh, that we could access only ourselves. <laughs> Some of us, right? But Sometimes. I mean, you, you at least assumed that you could think a private thought, that you right. had a right to mental privacy, that you had freedom of thought, maybe not freedom of expression, but freedom of thought, right? And freedom of thought, uh, mental privacy, self-determination, all are under threat by these different technologies. And so understanding it as both the techno-optimism, which is the right to, access and change our brains if we choose to do so by having a right to use these technologies in ways that benefit us, but also a right from the commodification of our brains and our mental experiences, the uh, access to interference, manipulation, and punishment for our thoughts. That alignment and helping people see that the AI problems of mental manipulation and the social media problems of recommender systems and uh, you know dopamine hits that are being you know developed to try to drive compulsive behavior that lead to harm or neurotechnologies where uh, the same kind of business model that's based on commodification of the data and its use in employment settings or use by governments in ways that are oppressive and surveillance are interrelated. And so coming up with a common update, for example, to our understanding of international human rights law, to say there's right to cognitive liberty, that means updating our understanding of self-determination to be a personal and individual right, updating privacy to include mental privacy, and updating freedom of thought to cover this spectrum of uh, right against interference, manipulation, and punishment, and then translating that into national laws, mm -hmm. right? And so that those concepts are embedded in when the FTC is looking to figure out what constitutes an unfair trade practice. An unfair trade practice is one that engages in mental manipulation of the users, uh, which is a violation of our freedom of thought. And what that means is that practices that are designed to induce compulsion and cause harm, like 
I'll name one that I think is problematic, Snapchat streaks, right? This is without any reprieve for a child, right? Where they have social pressures and punishment for doing so. They have to buy now a right to have a break of a streak, right? It's induced compulsion and then you have to pay to have relief from it mm. where it's causing clear harm, right? Like it's, it's literally a, what I call a cognitive construct that's mm. designed to diminish well-being, And that's unfair, right? That actually is a design that the FTC should go after. And so you can see how you can start to get alignment and, and helping people name and frame the problem has been part of what mm. I've been trying to do is to say, look, this is a collective set of problems and then that collectively helps us understand that we have to work on laws, whether it's human rights, national laws, legislation and regulation. We have to work on incentives to move toward legacy tech companies that are really focused on extracting data and keeping people's attention and engagement on devices to be about cognitive flourishing, to be about you know, actual liberty and expansion to look at commercial design, to give people user level controls, right? Each of these different domains from research to cultivating it in individuals to incentives across the board, um, I'm starting to see movement. We're starting to see movement and you see it, whether it's in language about safeguarding people against manipulation and what you know the Schumer uh, kind of group put out to how the FTC is thinking about it, to how UNESCO is thinking about the governance of AI and neurotechnologies, to how the UN is moving in this direction. So there's some commonality. Mm -hmm. um, and you know the OECD put out principles of uh, responsible innovation and in neurotechnology. They also are working on a broader framework of responsible innovation in um, emerging technologies. They see how they're interrelated and are trying to work on a common framework across technologies. That's, I think, the approach that we need is to realize Technologies move too quickly that doing a tech by tech by tech mm -hmm. approach to it isn't the solution. It's naming the common set of kind of concerns that we have and then trying to legislate adaptively and develop incentives and norms that align with that. So I feel like Congress was starting to really breathe heavily down the necks of the social media, social tech companies. This in a way gives them a break doesn't it? Because to your point, if we're going to roll it all up into a bigger basket of all the technologies, communications and otherwise that are impacting our well-being, then where we were headed with the social media uh, regulation is going to be put on hold. Maybe is not, it? because I think it recognizes that the social media harms are some of the most egregious ones mm -hmm. and the recommender systems that they've put into place. Like there are studies that show when you take a 15 second video and pair it with um, something like a recommender system that's actually saying like, you know, you don't have to choose. It's just going to feed you what you're interested in, that the activation of the motivation reward system locks you in in a way that's far more addictive and problematic than if you didn't use a recommender system and you instead just used something that was more generalized to like what's popular in your region rather than tailored to you uniquely. And when you start to see that, right, which is that the social media platforms are probably the most advanced in their use of the techniques right now to capture and to addict and to mm -hmm. limit and constrict the cognitive liberty of individuals, I think they still become prime targets and the first ones that you go after, but you start to see those same features in the design of generative AI, right? Making it look and sound as human-like as possible, um, trying to have it uh, play to cognitive biases and heuristics and, and humans to lock them in and to lead them to be more likely to buy into misinformation and disinformation. It's not as obvious yet for a lot of people on how to deal with those problems in generative AI. So I think it's more likely you end up going after still the social media companies first. Mm -hmm. That's right. If you return to the frame of like first contact with AI, create, uh, curation AI, social media, second contact is generative AI. Like the thing that is being exploited is still our attention, our engagement. Um, and so it'll just become impossible for us to ignore the effects. Uh, and hence, I think the regulations or protections put in place for second contact harms will absolutely need to address first contact mm -hmm. harms. You also asked the question, like, are you an optimist or a pessimist? Are you a techno-optimist or a techno-pessimist? And honestly, I think the framing of optimist versus pessimist is a terrible 
terrible one. And the reason why is because when you label yourself as an optimist or a pessimist, you are saying, this is the answer that I want, mm -hmm. and therefore I'm going to blind myself to anything that isn't that answer. So it becomes a not exactly a self-fulfilling prophecy, mm -hmm. but it means you're not connected with reality. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't say optimist or pessimist. You just say, like, let me see the world as accurately as I can mm -hmm. so I can show up in a way that helps it go well. Um, I always return to the Upton Sinclair quote, which is like, you can never depend on a man seeing what his paycheck demands him not to, mm. right? And like when I look at what Andreessen puts out, of, of course that's the view that he has to take in order to feel good about what he does in the world. But that's different than saying, of course, that all technology is bad. I'm not saying that either. It's saying we want a clear appraisal so that we can live in a world that we want, that we can get the cancer drugs out of AI and not have all of our supply chains break and have like uh, increased like pandemics and, and all of that. I so might that's... disagree a little bit for a moment, which is to say I am an optimist. Mm. Um, and I'm an optimist in the following sense, which is I believe in humanity and I believe that we can align technology in ways that are good for human flourishing. Um, I don't think that means I put blinders on. I think most people would actually look at me and think that I see the dystopian future, you know, kind of quite clearly. But me, I, for me, optimism yeah. is about trying to optimize the outcome for humanity, I, for I the planet. Is, like, I leave room for hope. And yes. I always seek hope. Yes. yes. But that doesn't so, make me optimistic. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right, fair so enough. Fair enough. <laughs> right. I have two questions for you guys. Because I have now moved out of a purely digital realm into this place where digital interfaces with meat space, which yeah. is such a great way to refer to humanity, isn't it? <laughs> meat space. Um, but let's talk because we're at a neuroscience conference specifically about mental health. Mm. And yes, there are many ways in which these tools have been destroying our mental health and have created the anxiety and the stress and the self-loathing and, and so forth that we're all so concerned about. But ironically, they also offer us a path to resolution or at least addressing 100%. these things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as you do this, you know, I can imagine, I was just thinking my son is a VR developer and I was mm -hmm. just thinking you put on that headset, well, why not have that be an EEG, right? At the same time. And, you know, it's Some doing of them the are eye already. tracking yeah. and, and all the rest of it. And then yeah. what a perfect feedback loop. In the medical sphere, we're always looking for more data. And the more data we have that we can feed into our models, the better we are at predicting and intervening and perhaps even, you know, preventing things from happening or things from getting worse. So how do you distinguish between the technologies that see inside someone's brain to help their mental state mm -hmm. and those which will help them make the right choice when it comes to, you know, which pair of jeans to buy? I think the idea of cognitive liberty, the right to self-determination, is also the right to access those, those technologies, right? For improvement of mental health, for the hope that it can offer for humanity, right? I think it's stunning that we know virtually nothing about what's happening in our own brains, uh, that most people know the number of steps they've taken today <laughs> or you know their That's heart true. rate or their blood pressure. But in terms of accurate understanding of what's happening in our own brains, we know almost nothing. Yeah. And these technologies will change that, right? They will give us intimate self-access that is much better than our internal software for being able to access ourselves. And that's everything from really being able to distinguish between stress and other kinds of experiences that you're having, being able to reveal to yourself your own cognitive biases, being able to have better understanding of your own pain and your own well-being, neurological disease and suffering, new tools to be able to better address depression and mental health disorders, neurological disease and suffering, early detection of you know different diseases and data is needed for that, right? I mean, the more longitudinal real world data that we have for the common good to be able to address the leading causes of neurological disease and suffering, the more promise for humanity. So I believe strongly that these technologies can be transformational for the human condition in ways that really could reverse the trends that we're seeing of increased neurological disease and suffering across the world. And so, Self-determination over your brain and mental experiences includes a right to access those technologies to be able to share that data for use for the common good with very strong purpose, limit, 
collections on data, right? If I want to share my brain data to try to go into the treasure trove of information that we mine to be able to understand neurological disease and suffering, I should be able to do so. And I should also be able to do so confident that that same data is not going to be repackaged, remined, and interrogated to you know, be used in workplace for surveillance of attention and mind wandering, or used by governments for purposes of you know, uh, making you know, people's brains be subject to interrogation for criminal offenses. And so it's about trying to ensure that that hopeful future is one that can be realized with technology that will pierce the final fortress of privacy, the final fortress of humanity. Um, and, you know, I have hope, hmm. maybe not optimism in this instance, that we can get this right and that if we can get it right, I think it could be truly the most transformative technology that we've ever enabled and ever shepherded in. And also if we choose poorly and we don't put into the right place the right safeguards, I think it could become the most oppressive technology that we ever have unleashed on society. Yeah. The paradox of technology is the greater it understands us, the greater it can serve and protect us, and the greater it can exploit us. And I think it's important to remember the three laws of technology, the ones that I wish I knew when I was starting my career. And that is one, when you invent a new technology, you uncover a new class of responsibility. Hmm. And it's not always obvious, right? Like, um, why should creating JavaScript and web pages have required writing new laws about being forgotten? Like, we didn't need the right to be forgotten written into law until technology could remember us forever, or the internet could remember us forever. We didn't need the right for privacy to be written into law until Kodak produced the mass-produced camera. Um, hmm. We didn't need to have any like international uh, treaties on refrigerants until we discovered the ozone. And so what happens, you invent a new technology, that new technology confers power. Um, that power then gets used to find some commons that wasn't protected and exploit it, extract it, because mm -hmm. that's how you maximize profit. So rule one, when you invent a new technology, you want to un uncover a new class of responsibility. Rule two, if the technology confers power, you start a race. And rule three, if you do not coordinate, that race will end in tragedy as you exploit that thing. Mm. And what's happening with brain-computer interfaces is that we're opening up brand new surface areas of the ineffable parts of the human experience, like our internal worlds, like the way our brains represent things, like our, our final poker face. And so we don't have rules or laws yet to protect that. And so what I find so important about Nita's work is she's doing the work of like Brandeis, who had to invent sort of whole cloth, the idea of privacy and editorial constitution for what are the parts of us humans that need to be protected. And if we don't do that, then rational actors acting in market interests will do maximum exploitations of anything that isn't protected. There's one thing around preventing bad things from happening. There's another whole way of thinking about this, which is that we literally are on the verge of transforming our species, right? Mm -hmm. So our smartphone external brains, you know, the people here at this conference are doing the brain implant, that's the next step. And it's one thing to prevent harm, but it's yet another to say, yes, we want to avoid that, and here's where we want to go. Mm -hmm. Are we at a point in our evolution where all-knowing humanity, homo sapiens, should be mapping out a future for our species? Should there be a cognitive, I mean, you talk about cognitive literacy, uh, liberty, but should there be a master plan for how we deploy technology? Should there be a strategic plan? Should there be a creative brief? Because we know what the product roadmap looks like, mm -hmm. and we've already got some of those products. So I, I in, in my book talk, in the last chapter, about um, the concept of beyond human, right? That uh, the transformation of humanity has already begun, right? And whether that's our cell phone or uh, the kind of growing um, ways in which we can access and change our brains, it has started. Uh, and, you know, it's been in motion for a very long time. I think the question is who's at the table for some of the more transformational pieces that we invite? And I think a broader public dialogue, a broader process of democratic deliberation to understand that transformative process is really important. I also think it's really important that people start to understand 
the kind of evolution of self from like, I am me in this like little container of Nita versus I am a relational being and I exist and myself is relational to you and relational to my environment and relational to technology. And when we start to have a more evolved understanding of self as, you know, through this concept of relational autonomy or relational intelligence, I think it's a lot easier to begin to understand the impacts of technology and how that's changing things. As for a master plan, I don't think that we have omniscience to understand where all of this is going, but I think having a better understanding of ourselves as relational beings can help us be more intentional about those changes that are occurring. The question, the wrong question to ask is like, what are we doing to ourselves? The right question to ask is who we must be to survive. And to answer that question cannot be in the hands of a small number of people who are making technology which will transform the nature of what it is to be human, how to relate, and how we make it on this planet. And what's great is that some of these new technologies, I think Audrey Tang, who's the digital minister of Taiwan, is really pioneering them for how you can have not just a small group of people deliberate, but an entire nation of individuals deliberate in a way that is legible to our political system so that we can all work to answer the question of who we must be. My, um, my friend, Mustafa Suleiman, who was one of the co-founders of DeepMind, said something I thought was very profound. He said, in the age of AI, progress will be defined no longer by what we say yes to, but what we say no to. It's sort of like Gandalf looking at the One Ring and being like, I no, I do not have the wisdom to be able to hold this power. I say no to picking it up. And that kind of maturity is the maturity we're going to need as humanity to say, of all the technology and powers in front of us, you know, to quote E.O. Wilson, we have Paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike power, that our wisdom is not yet up to like wield that power. So either we need to like slow down or increase our wisdom. And that to me is the question of who we must be. My hope for brain health with brain computer interfaces is that we can develop a new level of understanding of ourselves. I sort of think we're at this point as a species where we are taking the telescope of our own intelligence and pointing it back at ourselves. And there is incredible power and potential there, right? Like the ability to solve uh, treatment uh, resistant depression, things like that. Um, the concern, of course, is that if you point your intelligence back at yourself, that's sort of like taking a camera and pointing it at a computer screen that has a picture of the camera, and you sort of get in this infinite feedback loop. Um, and humanity may well do that, where like we've opened up our medical forical skull, or like putting our hand up and like jerking on some of like the controls going straight into our brain and like you hit a jerk here which makes your hand jerk more and like it goes out of control. So in order for us to live with the benefits, um, we're gonna have to have a serious conversation about what are the market incentives that will drive the use. Most people's attention goes to what are the bad actors going to do, but actually it's not just the bad actors, it's what do rational actors do under market incentives. If you notice, most of the terrible things that have happened with social media haven't happened because of bad actors. It's just companies pursuing uh, advertising. So in order to reach the beautiful potential of what BCI does, we have to have that honest reflection of into what landscape are we they going to be deployed. Everything is a coordination problem, right? It's uh, what would we have to do to solve climate change? It's a coordination problem. Uh, we have enough food in the world to feed everyone. Why isn't it distributed uh, appropriately? It's a coordination problem. The reason why I think conferences like this are so important is that before a technology is widely deployed and it becomes entangled in an economy, is this is the opportunity to coordinate so that the rules of the road, both locally and internationally, that bind all actors can be set.